Hello, and welcome to this lecture on the circulatory system. Again, we're following Raven et al., uh, 10th edition of biology as we move through it. This will be chapter 49 if you have that book. The circulatory system, here is an example of a circulatory system from a uh, deceased human. Uh, you can see it's very complex. It has a lot of pieces. It has a lot of components that touch on many different body systems. It is critical for a number of reasons. And it, is, it produces beautiful structures uh, throughout the body, these wonderfully uh, uh, branching structures that, that are found throughout the body itself. When it works well, it is extremely important. And when it fails to operate uh, at some level, then there are often uh, collateral consequences to that because of the amount of systems that depend on the circulatory system. So let's get into it. So here is the guide. Again, this will be chapter 49 if you're following along. What I'd like you to be able to do are the things that are listed here after you're done with this lecture and after you've read the chapter. And I've also posted to your right a picture of an earthworm, which has a circulatory system as well. It is, shares many similarities with human circulatory systems, which will be the primary focus of the uh, lecture today, but it also has like a number of notable differences as well. Uh, so we'll try to understand how things like the circulatory system evolved and how different animals use them. All right, one of the things that might be useful is if you've done the reading to go ahead and do the questions, which I'm going to follow here. So which of the following are cells which circulate in the body? Erythrocytes, leukocytes, platelets, a and B, or all of the above? The answer in this case is A and B. These are the only two cells that are actually listed. They actually have the word cell in the name erythrocyte. Leukocyte means cell, right? Platelets are not actually complete cells. They're portions of cells that are released into the body. And of course, they're very important for clotting, uh, but they themselves are not cells. Another question that you could ask yourself, Erythrocytes have one major function in the body. They transport oxygen. Do they attack pathogens? Do they initiate clot formation? Or is it not listed in the above? The answer here is erythrocytes are called red blood cells in uh, it's common language, but they are actually truly should be given the name erythrocyte. However, it is very common in my experience to see even uh, uh, professionals refer to them as red blood cells or RBCs. So you should be familiar with both terms. They will come up, but I want you to be aware that erythrocytes primary function, of course, is to transport oxygen. They are useful in forming clots and they never attack pathogens. So they have no use in that, in that way, uh, but they do transport oxygen around the, the organism. Lastly, the image below shows erythrocytes and there is a leukocyte. See if you can tell which one is which. And these are from a non-human. What is unusual about these erythrocytes? Is it in humans, erythrocytes are rarer than leukocytes? Is it B, in humans, erythrocytes have no nuclei? Or is it C, in humans, erythrocytes actually have irregular shapes? It actually turns out this is the case. So while we think of red blood cells or erythrocytes as not being nucleated, unnucleated cells, in most organisms, actually, red blood cells are, like most other cells, nucleated. Regular shapes are critical, in fact, so no organism has irregularly shaped erythrocytes, as far as I know, are critical for the circulation of blood. It helps move through small channels. Leukocytes are always going to be rare. They're expensive to maintain. They're dangerous because they eat and destroy other cells, uh, and they, you really only need a small subset unless you're infected. They also don't have the function of carrying a lot of materials with them. They really don't carry materials to other cells. So if you had a lot of things like leukocytes in your blood, as in the case, let's say, with leukemia, then you would not have uh, the capacity to carry things like nutrients and oxygen throughout the body. All right, so we've already alluded to a number of the features that circulation is useful for. Let's review then what circulation is used for. So a number of different things. One of the most obvious, of course, is that it's important for the transport. It's especially important for the transport of oxygen, but I also want you to consider what else blood is transporting. So think about that, right? So everything that cells rely on for metabolism that they themselves do not generate, so they are gonna generate their own proteins, for instance, and that's gonna be useful in their metabolic pathways, but everything else has to be brought to them. 
for regulation, uh, blood circulation is critical. Think about the importance of moving, moving water around to help regulate temperature, right? If your blood did not circulate, it would be much harder to regulate temperature in your body because the, the sectors of it could heat up, but other sectors would remain relatively cold. And as a result, blood circulation is going to be very critical for the maintenance and control of body temperatures uh, all the time. Hence the reason you might feel flushed when you are in a hot environment, right? All that circulation is opening up to try to expel as much heat as possible. It's having a hard time doing that. Or hence the reason that various part portions of your body feel cold when you're outside, right? Blood is being shut off to those areas to try to conserve heat elsewhere. But blood is also really important for the transport of signals. So for instance, how does your body know, let's say if you take an injection of testosterone, how does your body know how to respond to it? Well, it's got to enter your circulation and then be moved around the body. And that injection will then inform other cells about what they should be going about doing. And then finally, blood and circulation is very important for protection of the body systems. This is one that is obviously critical. Blood goes almost everywhere in the body, or at least gets very close to almost everywhere in the body. Uh, but one of the things that it is also doing is transporting those leukocytes around, which by and large are able to get to almost every place in the body, excusing the nerves, right? So we said that there's a blood brain, brain barrier and that access to things like the nervous system is actually very difficult for a variety of reasons and we'll talk more about that when we get to the nervous system uh, but they are very important for transporting materials and for providing those uh, leukocytes near sites of infection so what are the components of blood well it turns out that erythrocytes make up a fairly large component of it here you see it about 40 percent Leukocytes are relatively rare, We're really talking about a minority of things. They may make up something like one-ish percent of the actual blood. Platelets are also packed in there. And then the other thing that blood is primarily composed of, this is a majority of blood in fact, is things like water, protein, um, there's a bit of nutrient. There are waste materials, of course. The body is expelling waste materials from metabolism, taking up nutrients. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, things like ions are also passing around, right? So when you are dehydrated and you consume a beverage with a lot of ions, those ions are transported into the circulation, and the circulation distributes them out to the body very rapidly. It only takes a few minutes to actually distribute those ions out. But keep in mind that, of course, the, the major components of blood then are effectively plasma, the watery bit, which is in fact often yellow uh, when you spin it down. That's what you're seeing on the right is a column that has been spun in a centrifuge, and this is exactly what it looks like, and then red blood cells, which will collect at the bottom. And all of the blood cells, all of the components of the blood cell actually start from a stem cell which gives rise to all of these different uh, cell types. So it's interesting to note, of course, that there are uh, erythrocytes are tucked in here next to a number of other uh, cell types, but many of these are actually uh, leukocytes, right? So erythrocytes share a lot of relationship with leukocytes. Now stem cells can give rise to a large number of cells. A lot of people get confused and think stem cells can give rise to anything some and a very rare number of stem cells can give rise to any cell in the body. These are all gone by the time that you are, in a, are uh, anywhere near uh, birth. You really don't, you don't have the ability to produce a totipotent stem cell, which can become anything, but you do have many stem cells and st some types of stem cells will be with you until the day you die. Those stem cells are important in producing some uh, cells. They can't produce every cell, but they can produce some. So cells like this one here at the top this multipotent stem cell are found in blood, are found in bone marrow, and they will produce the components of blood. And you can see that they split into two different cell types very rapidly, and then they become different things. So they can generate things like erythrocytes and things like megakaryocytes. Megakaryocytes actually produce platelets, and you can see that sort of budding they have in this picture here. Platelets are actually the budding of the plasma membrane uh, that will be released into the, the body itself. And then those platelets will be used in the case of, say, if you need a clot to be formed uh, by just passing them around the body. And when a uh, break 
uh, occurs, the clots will form. It turns out clots are formed also uh, by the slowing of blood, so that will also cause them to start to activate. So you have to be careful as well, keep this in mind, we'll talk about it in just a bit, you'll see why, uh, to make sure to walk around uh, frequently, even when you've been sitting for some time. So humans have not evolved to sit in front of computer screens. I would recommend you take regular breaks and walk, or walk around. It will help your circulation and help keep you healthier. Now we've talked a lot about humans already. I've even introduced you to cell types in humans. I haven't actually shown you cell types in lots of other animals. But I wanna point out that hearts are not universal across this, what we call the metazoans. Uh, they're in these other organisms when cells are very close in contact with another, or the body is pumping regularly and producing uh, movement of fluid within it, and there's less importance placed on, say, controlling things like temperature, there's really no need for a heart. Jellyfishes pump regularly. That pumping of the body will move any fluids that are inside. There are very few cells, right? So the layers that things have to move through are relatively rare. And so it's unimportant to have something like a heart. This changes relatively rapidly as we get into more complex body plans. But even here, movement of body is usually sufficient to move some fluid material within the body to move the materials like uh, protective cells uh, and nutrients around the body. So the actual beating of a structure is not necessary in these guys as well. When we go into a number of other groups, numerous other groups have some sort of muscular organ which pumps fluid. The way in which these pump fluid are very different. In very highly derived groups, there is a need to have a very complex uh, system to pumping blood, especially true if you're going to pay for things like a large brain you're gonna to need to regularly bathe that brain in things like nutrients and oxygen. And so you should anticipate that the most complex hearts are gonna be found in things like chordates, right? That are gonna have these relatively complex uh, systems that they need to keep fed. You're also gonna find complexity in things like arthropods, right? They may not have quite the complexity of chordates, but they do have, uh, in, in things like the brain, uh, but they do have very complex structures and they will also require pumping of fluids through some muscular organ to keep their fluids bathed in nutrients and oxygen. Here's an example of an arthropod system. Arthropods have what's called an open circulatory system. Open circulatory systems have a series, often a series of muscular pumps, which move material around. You'll notice that the what would be veins and arteries in vertebrates are not connected, right? And what happens is there's just a fluid and then there's a pump that moves that fluid within the body. The body movement of the animal also helps to move the fluid within the body. And this works very well for things like arthropods, which actually don't have things like lungs. Uh, and so their fluid is just bathed in and around places where oxygen is diffusing in. This is not the most efficient system in that uh, things that are, are fluid that is unoxygenated is mixing regularly with oxygenated fluid, but it works very effectively for the arthropods and it has been a, a very successful group, right? So clearly open circulatory systems are still very successful, albeit they lack some of the complexity that closed circulation uh, has like in the vertebrates. So let's talk about the vertebrate heart a bit. What I would like to do is point out some differences here. Notice the simplicity of early hearts, right? So if we look at something like a tunicate heart, there's basically just a little beating uh, section of that uh, body that moves material. Compare that already to a lamprey heart, right? We already see the four chambers that will be used. Again, I know your book refers to it as two chambers, but there are clearly four areas of this heart uh, that will be contained in uh, upper, uh, more, uh, more advanced vertebrate hearts. And what you can see is that there's a large leap between these two, right? Part of the reason for that is that it's actually hard to find intermediates because the intermediate hearts are all in extinct animals. So a lot of the extinct animals that we would look at uh, don't exist. So clearly the evolution of the vertebrate heart it occurred early in vertebrate history, and it has persisted largely in the same structure, albeit there have been some uh, serious modifications to it uh, for long periods of time, right? So the fact that you can recognize chambers in a lamprey heart suggests that the vertebrate heart as a whole has been sort of set now for about 500 million years, which is sort of shocking when you think about it. 
Let's look at our own heart here down at the bottom briefly because I'd like to compare it to a chicken. Uh, we'll look at this more closely, but as you know, your book calls us a four-chambered heart. That's fine. Really, it's feeding two circulation systems and the fluids never mix. There'll be an input and an output. Compare that over here to the to the chicken heart, which independently evolved four chambers, right? They look very similar, although there are some differences. Look at how the, the arteries and veins cross over each other. So these are clearly evolved separately, although they both came from similar systems, right? So the partially divided heart of things like the green anole are a good example of intermediates. So when, when we get into the vertebrates proper, right, we have very good evidence to suggest that there is a a uh, slow uh, and gradual process from which we go to a linear heart, to a heart that's folded over that has multiple chambers, to a heart that's partially divided uh, and that can pass uh, mostly the oxygenated blood in one direction, mostly the unoxygenated blood in another direction, to in say the birds and the mammals, these very advanced systems where blood is truly passed, it does not mix and you have two separate circulatory pathways, one to the lungs and one out to the body. One thing I would recommend at this point, if you feel like you uh, could do it, is to see if you could draw a circulatory system in a fish, right? So think also as you draw that, what are some limitations of a unidirectional circulatory system? And I would pause at this slide and do that before you move on. So there are a number of limitations associated with fish hearts. Tuna, it turns out, are a great example of this. So if you've ever eaten canned tuna, if you've eaten a fish like this, maybe not this specific kind of tuna, there are many kinds, but uh, they, tuna are very fast moving fish. They're some of the fastest moving fish in the ocean. They are really adapted to high intensity, long, uh, continuous swimming. So hence the reason they have very dark meat. They need a lot of blood to provide muscles lots and lots of oxygen because they swim at very high speeds for almost uh, their entire adult lives. So they almost don't stop swimming. Tuna, it turns out, have a limitation as a result of that. As you know, tuna hearts are like any other fish heart. The heart is going to pump blood to the gills. The blood is then gonna move from the gills out to the body and then return to the heart. There is no repressurization as we have in vertebrate, other vertebrate hearts that, uh, or I should say tetrapod hearts where there's some form of repressurization, even in the amphibians. And so as a result, as it moves out from the gills, the pressure falls very, very rapidly. That means that the ability of things like yellowfin tuna to elevate their cardiac output is extremely limited. If their heart pumps very, very rapidly or very, very at a very, very high rate, they'll actually burst the capillaries in their gills. So they're limited by the rate, the high rate that their heart can reach. In your case, if you actually needed more fluid, right, you could pump differently. You could pump very hard to the lungs that might cause uh, capillaries to burst, hence the reason you taste that sort of irony taste when you're working out very, very hard and you're breathing really hard. But you can actually put a lot of energy into pumping it out into the body. And so things like the aorta, which is gonna accept the blood going out to the body first, can be reinforced very, very heavily and you can have very high output of uh, very high energy and very fast moving blood so that you can sustain the body with a lot of uh, oxygenated blood even when you're doing very high intensity activity. As a result, when you compare that to a tuna, tuna are very sensitive to these warmer environments because their hearts actually beat very close to their maximum rate almost all the time. And when you elevate the temperature even slightly, the heart cannot sustain the body at that kind of output and tuna will die. Tuna actually are very, very good at diving down to very deep depths. And just the way as I warned you earlier in the class when I said that endothermy, which your book seems to be very fascinated by, is not that big a deal. Tunas are actually also endothermic in that they maintain their body well above that of sea uh, water and they are actually hot. So if you ever catch a tuna and you cut it open immediately and you put your hand inside, your hand will feel very, very warm. And that's because tunas maintain their bodies at very warm temperatures. All right, so we've talked a little bit now about how systems work, some of the limitations. We talked 
briefly about the evolution of these heart. I'm, I warned you that complexity has increased, as you should anticipate, and it's sort of epitomized in the in the vertebrate heart where we have incredible amounts of, of complexity and actually really detailed understanding of how the heart may have evolved, uh, at least from uh, a simple fish heart to a more advanced thing like a bird or, or a mammal heart. So what do I expect you to know about the anatomy of the heart? So if you take an anatomy course, or you have taken an anatomy course, of course, uh, then you will know that there's tons and tons of pieces to know. I expect you to know pretty limited things for this course. I would like you to know what an atrium is. I would like you to know what a ventricle is. I would like you to know that you have two of each. And I would like you to know that there are valves in the heart. I want you to be able to identify where those are located, right? And being able to identify them will actually help you understand the structure and function of the heart. So this is this will go hand in hand. I know it sounds like memorization, and there is a bit of it, but it's actually going to help you understand how the heart actually functions. And you should know what these structures are actually doing. So let's take a look at that. Also, this cake looks delicious, by the way. I know that this is food coloring, and I know that it's lying to me and telling me that there's lots of good nutrients in there, but it looks really good. So here's a human heart. This is a classic example. I really like this one. It's a nice clean cut of a human heart. On both the top of the, uh, the left and the right side, on the top of the heart is a right and left atrium. You will notice that these are labeled incorrectly as you look at them, right? The right atrium is on your left side right now, and the left atrium is on the right side. Well, it actually turns out that this heart is spun to face you, right? So the left atrium is actually the left side of your body, and the right atrium would be the right side of your body. This picture does an also a nice job of coloring uh, what are veins coming in. So what you can see here are veins that are entering the heart. And this is where blood will enter into the heart. So blood will come in and pool in the right atrium. And as it pools in the right atrium, the atrium will contract and then it will force it down this pathway into the right ventricle, right? So here's the right ventricle right here and the left ventricle is on the other side. Notice how much smaller the right ventricle is. The right ventricle is gonna pass that blood out. It's gonna go through, this is an artery in fact, this is gonna go out to the lungs, okay? That's going to pass out to the lungs and then that the material from the lungs is going to come back into now the left atrium. The left atrium is going to collect the blood from the lungs. That's going to be pumped into the left ventricle through a valve. That white area is a valve. And then the left ventricle is going to be able to pump that all the way out here. And that's going to go out into the body, okay, through the aorta. Look at the thickness and size of the left ventricle. Look how large that is. And that makes sense. You're a large organism. You have a lot of material that has to be pumped long distances, potentially meters across the body, right? Lots and lots of, of pressure needs to be generated. So one of the reasons that things like aortas are vulnerable uh, when you are obese is because there's so much pressure that needs to be generated in the left ventricle that the aorta is not able to sustain that level of pressure for, let's say, years at a time, right? It may be able to do a pump. That's not a problem. Maybe even do tens of thousands of pumps. But it, you're asking it to maybe be uh, sustained under those pressures for years and years and years at a time. And that causes it ultimately to weaken. And then you can have it it either develop a small tear or it creates clots as it's tearing uh, or it may burst in that case, right? And then that case you would have a system where you would have a lot of bleeding because the left ventricle would need to keep pumping to get blood out to the body, but it would be very, very difficult for things like clots to form or the aorta to repair itself. Then lastly on this, all these white things are valves and these valves are actually going to help separate the atriums and the ventricles and the veins and the arteries so that they aren't just mixing, they're mixing in the one direction you want them to go, right? You want a unidirectional flow of blood. You want blood always to be going in one direction, not to be going backwards. Otherwise, if you didn't have valves, when your heart contracted, it would push your blood both in both directions, both through your arteries and through your veins. So blood that you would get a sort of a, an issue of you could not oxygenate half the blood and you would not mix very well. So you actually need to have these valves to make sure that blood is traveling in the right direction.
All right, the other thing that's important to note here is the heart, of course, can generate impulses to beat. So if you've ever dissected a very recently killed frog or any recently killed animal, if you've ever gone fishing and you've, dis and you've filleted a fish, a lot of people get very excited because they see that the hearts of these organisms are beating. That's true of everything. If you uh, had been alive in medieval ages and you had watched an execution, occasionally people would remove the, the individual's heart and it would beat in someone's hand. People were very excited about this. Okay, so the heart is still beating, the person is clearly dead. Well, it turns out cardiac muscles actually can send their own impulses. So they beat for some amount of time uh, well after the body is dead, or I should say the brain is dead. However, what we haven't talked about yet are nervous tissues, but the nervous system will be able to alter the rhythm. So while the heart may have some static beat, the nervous system can alter that beat to control how fast and how long those beats are occurring. The heart does have an intrinsic ability to send beats, but if it gets confused at some point, right, if the beat is not sent in just the right order, then what you can have is what's called ventricular, ventricular fibrillation. A lot of people think that things like the shock pedals that you see in movies um, it, are actually used to start the heart. That's incorrect. The only time you would use a defibrillator is if you're under ventricular fibrillation. And so when you actually go and try to use these systems, they will ask you to go through a series of steps to make sure that that is in fact the case. Because if you shock someone with a, with a heart that's not beating at all, that's not gonna help you. And if you shock someone with a normally beating heart, that could cause serious issues. So if the heart signal is confused such that the heart is no longer beating in rhythm, it's sort of all beating simultaneously and it's not producing a strong uh, pumping action, it's just it's sort of uh, vibrating, then what will happen when you hit it with this big jolt of, of electricity is you will stop the heart briefly and allow it to try to reset. So you'll make it skip a cycle and allow it to try to reset on the next cycle. If it is successful, you don't shock again. If you're unsuccessful, you may shock again. Also to be clear, it's not, um, this is not a good feeling. So you would not normally do this unless the, you had no other options. So this is a, it, and you also, uh, you wanna be a little careful about piercings and other things that conduct electricity, right? These are gonna produce a lot of voltage. If you have a piercing across your chest and you get hit by a defib, you're gonna have some nice burning there. Uh, and people are probably not gonna spend the time to remove piercings. Just a word to the wise when you're uh, thinking about your future. All right, and so this is how those paddles would need to be set up in some way. They would need to cross a, the entire heart, right? So frequently they'll tell you to put them above the right pectoral and usually down low below the left pectoral. You would not put them, let's say above both nipples because then you actually would not cross the heart and the electrical impulse would not generate the signal that you actually wanted. Take a look at this here. This is actually the nerves that are placed within the heart, it's, or that are within the heart itself. We haven't talked about nerves yet in the sense that we haven't spent a whole lecture on them, but I want you to see that uh, the nerves here are gonna be very similar in some ways, and we're gonna talk about how they actually work in that nervous system lecture, but they are structured to be throughout the heart. There is a node, there, there are two nodes, I should say, um, and then there are a number of sort of these long skinny nerves which extend down from it, the Purkinje fibers, right? Clearly this looks like a heart, right? Let's talk a little bit about what these actually do. What happens for the heart to beat is up at this SA node, there will be a signal sent and that will cause the atria to contract. Here I'm using atria, so I've added an A to the end and removed the um. Right, so I said atrium before, I should say atria when I'm talking about multiple th uh, atria. That will pass to the atricular ventric atrioventricular node, right, and there it will be paused ever so briefly, okay? Why is the impulse paused as it exits the atria? From there, uh, the pulses now travels down what's called the atrioventricular bundle, and it's now contained, okay? So before, look at how the nerves are spread out across the atria. Look here at how they're condensed into one little tiny narrow uh, area. Also, I want you to take a look and see how the left atrium is very different from the right atrium. Look at how the nerves terminate there. They do not proceed on. 
Think about why this is the case. So I'm not going to necessarily answer these directly, but think about why this is the case. Ultimately, they bisect and travel by these bundle branches, and then out here, they turn up and they innervate the ventricles. Why do they turn up? So why don't they just terminate at the end there? So what I'm also going to do here is I'm going to link of another video of the heart beating. It's useful to have seen it this way in the sense that I've followed you through the pathway on a screen, but I really want you to actually see a heart beating. That will really help you understand how this system operates. So that's fine. The heart can control its own beating, but it's not very useful in most cases because the vast majority of time you need to actually modify it yourself, right? So there's all sorts of reasons why you would need to modify the heart rate. Not least of which the difference between when you're standing, when you're sitting, you need less or more pressure to move materials around the body. So there are nerves that do this. This is not under voluntary control. The vagus nerve can actually decrease the heart rate and the sympathetic cardiac nerves can increase the heart rate, but they can also increase stroke power if they need to. So they can make it the heart beat harder. So they could increase the rate, but they can also increase the strength at which that ventricle is squeezing to push all of the blood out. Why might there be differences between these two? The other thing I would like you to think about and to, to spend a little bit of time on is this, so cardiograms, especially electrocardiograms. I know that the colors here aren't great, but the advantage of this image is it shows a lot of things simultaneously. Let's start at the top and talk about a few things, and then we'll get down to the electrocardiogram, and I'll, I'll expect that you'll watch a video on that because, it again, we can discuss it, but I think watching it in action is far more helpful, in fact. Take a look at these three lines. There's aortic pressure, atrial pressure and ventricular pressure. You already know the atria are very weak walled and small, and therefore it should not surprise you now to see that the pressure they generate is relatively weak. It's interesting to note there's two little bumps here, right, right at A and right at C, and when you watch the video, it will make sense why that is the case. Look at the ventricular pressure though. Look at the strength and the height and the difference and how smooth rise that is and then how high it gets, okay? And look at also now the aortic pressure. So the ventricular pressure is high, but it eventually recovers to a very low rate. Look at how the aorta will always remain at a very, very high rate. Hence the reason, again, that it is vulnerable to things that cause large pressure increases, especially when they occur over, let's say, years or decades of time where that pressure is maintained for an extremely long period of time and the system begins to wear down. The next thing I want you to take a look at and understand is the electrocardiogram. There's this PQRST thing that's going on. Again, I'm not going to explain it here, but you can note that certain things are happening uh, when it's related to the uh, pressures that are changing. And of course, this has to do with the nerves firing, right? So you're, you're understanding something about how the, the signaling in the heart is changing the pressures in the system. And I, again, post that video right here uh, embedded within that you can go and watch. Whether you know much about the circulation system or not, you probably do know something already is that there are things called veins and arteries. Arteries are always taking blood away from the heart. So keep that in mind. Arteries are always taking blood away from the heart. As a result, they tend to be very, very well uh, protected in the sense that they are very elastic and strongly bound uh, with things like smooth muscle and, and uh, materials around them to help them hold uh, a lot of pressurized fluid. Compare that to, say, veins, which tend to be far thinner walled, uh, and they are always returning blood to the heart. Okay? Do not assume that just because of the veins are returning blood to the heart that they are always carrying deoxygenated blood. For instance, veins that return blood from the lungs are actually going to the heart, but they're carrying oxygenated blood. And arteries that are carrying blood to the lungs are actually carrying deoxygenated blood away from the heart. Okay, So it's again, it's the direction. Arteries carry blood away and need to be really strong to, to resist the high amounts of pressure that's going to be put against them. Veins can be much weaker walled and will be much weaker walled because the pressures are much, much lower that they're in, integrated with. 
as you move from an artery, there are these little tiny things. Uh, I'm not going to worry about you knowing. I will like you to know that there are capillaries, ultimately. Capillary beds, which you see right here that I'm circulating, are circling, are where the blood actually will be uh, diffuse, allow itself to diffuse materials out to the cells in the body. So arteries have a problem. They're very thick walled and very protected. Therefore, it's very hard for cells to actually get materials from them because it can't diffuse across that thick membrane. So instead, what's going to need to happen is arteries are going to have to break down very rapidly into very thin walled things called capillaries. The problem with capillaries is because they're very thin walled, they're not good at resisting pressure. And if you started by just having capillaries everywhere, the first time your heart pumped, it would burst all the capillaries. So you need to diffuse all of that across a huge range of capillaries. And again, hence when you're running or doing a lot of activity and you're actually, your heart is pumping very, very high amounts of blood, you can actually taste that sort of irony compound. That's because you are bursting some of your capillaries uh, and you are tasting a little bit of that blood flavor. Veins, on the other hand, are going to pick up right where the uh, capillaries start to come together, right? And they're going to return all that blood back to the heart. But they're going to be under a low pressure system. So how are they actually going to go about getting blood back to the heart? If the heart is pumping fluids away and it's going through a capillary bed at low pressure, how is it going to get blood back from the capillary beds that are now at low pressure to the heart? The other thing to think about is that because you're pushing blood through small capillaries and blood has a lot of water in it and you're putting incredibly high amounts of pressure behind it, there are going to be leaks. Water is going to escape. Some amount of fluid inside the, the uh, circulatory system is going to get out even in a closed circulatory system. Now cells may have a very hard time getting out, but the water is going to get out. You should expect that there will be leaks generated. And you need to have a system to recover that water and bring it back to the circulatory system, right? Otherwise, water will build up outside the circulatory system, and then you'll, you would be in effectively what's a dehydrated environment where you have a lot of cells and not very much fluid, and the heart has to beat really hard in those environments, really hard on the heart to do that. So what actually happens is the lymphatic system is deeply connected to the circulatory system. And as these fluids are pushed out of the circulatory system, the lymphatic system will collect them, and they will help to move the water back into the circulatory system. What else does a lymphatic system do? Well, the lymphatic system is really important in the protection of the body from pathogens, right? So it is part of, deeply connected to uh, the, the immune system. In this image I have here, which is often the case of image, I don't know why this is selected, but this sort of weird bright greenish color is used. Lymphatic systems will collect, as you can see here, they will be often have lots of branching ends that will be around capillary beds. As the fluid is pushed out in the capillary beds, it, the lymphatic system will pick up that fluid and then it will travel down the lymphatic system into uh, or return it into a vein uh, in, the, in the circulatory system. Take a look right here as well. You'll see that the lymphatic system has these cool looking valves. This will also be the same kind of system that is developed in uh, veins, and it is a it's a way to allow materials to be to be pumped up to the heart. And I'll explain that as we get into the veins. But for the moment, just look at that structure and see how cool that is. If, however, you do not have the ability to pump fluids back into the circulatory system what you will have is that fluid will build up outside the circulatory system. And that is exactly what has happened to this person here in the image. This is common in certain places in Africa where there is a nematode that can enter in and actually get, uh, can live inside of the lymphatic system. And if it blocks up certain lymphatic vessels, it will cause those lymphatic systems to fail to provide, to, to move the material back into the circulatory system. So this is a, a pathogen related issue and it is, it, it is easily treated if you can get rid of the worms in fact. So I mentioned that these are going to be systems that rely on some sort of pumping but they don't have hearts. And it turns out that if you're a fish swimming around in the ocean, you do have two hearts. The first heart of course is the heart itself but the other one is you have a bunch of muscles that are constantly pumping. 
And if you put a bunch of valves in your vein, when these muscles constrict, you can actually get unidirectional flow of fluid through the veins very, very easily without expending or without having another heart and expending more energy. And also the same will be true of lymphatic systems. You'll be able to use those lymphatic systems to pump. So what happens is every time that muscles, skeletal muscles especially, contract, they push fluid along with them. And as they push the fluid in the veins, the fluid can only move in one direction. So it will tend to move towards the heart. And that means that you need to move regularly, right? So fish that you evolved from were swimming very, very frequently and that we are not sedentary animals. And in fact, sedentary animals have evolved different, different ways to modify this pathway because they have this issue that they could have pooling. When pooling occurs, as you see in this image on the right, if it happens for too long, things like clots can form uh, and you can have issues where very young people uh, can have things like heart attacks and strokes not necessarily because the system is not functioning, but because they may sit for too long. So the, if you go into a, a news feed and you look up uh, something like playing video games too long causes gamer to die at 24 or something like that or whatever the age is, that actually does occasionally happen and it's exactly this issue. They need to move around regularly to return blood to the heart or they'll form lots of small clots throughout their body and they can potentially have heart to, heart attacks or strokes. This is also the same problem you have when you're on an airplane for a long time. So make sure that you regularly stretch your legs and that if possible, you take some amount of regular walking around the plane. Here, I would recommend going to and from the bathroom at least every now and then. You should also do some sort of movements in the seat. So do gentle stretching. And if you're on long plane flights, they actually will give you advice on how to do general stretching in your seat so you don't annoy your neighbors, right? So again, you do the pumping here. This is exactly the same way that veins and lymphatic systems work. It's when skeletal muscles contract, they pump the blood back to the heart. All right, so what we're gonna do is, for the moment on the schedule, we have a workshop planned. We may or may not actually operate the workshop. We'll let you know as we get closer to it. Uh, but for the moment, we will plan on trying to provide some material for that, although it's probably gonna be fairly limited. We do wanna debrief about your first week in a remote online learning environment and see what worked well for you, what didn't work well, and how we might improve it for the rest of the semester to make sure that we are getting you the materials that you need to understand the course.